Okay, so tonight is the June full moon night. It's known as Possum Poya in Sri Lanka. And in Pali it's called Jetapanamasa. In Sri Lanka, uh, it's actually the most important day in the Buddhist year. In fact, it's even more important than Vesak. And on this day, they celebrate the day that Arahat Mahinda brought Buddhism to Sri Lanka. Okay, so he brought it when he came. He first came to Mahintali. And on this day in Sri Lanka, normally about five million people will go to Mahintali and to Anuradhapura in order to celebrate the occasion. It's a really big festival in Sri Lanka. There are actually only about 18 million Buddhists in Sri Lanka and five million of them go to one, well not just to the one spot actually, they go to Mahintali which is where Mahinda first came and they go to Anuradhapura which is nearby, uh, just a I don't know, 15 kilometers or something uh, uh, away from Mahintali, which is where the ancient capital was. And it's also where the remains of this ancient civilization can still be seen today. And if we think about it, it's over 2,200 uh, years since Buddhism was introduced into Sri Lanka and they started the building of these great chaitiyas of the monasteries and of the uh, tanks and so on that's the reservoirs and so on uh, and they still can be seen there today so as a historical site as a pilgrimage site it's hardly to be surpassed anywhere in the world uh, so, I really encourage anybody who has the opportunity to go to Sri Lanka uh, to really try to make the effort and go and see some of these historical places and um, then you can appreciate for yourself how long that civilization has been established in Sri Lanka. So tonight I want to tell you uh, about the introduction of Buddhism to Sri Lanka. It was introduced by Mahinda and Venerable Sangamitta, his sister, and they were both children of King Ashoka. So we have to start by going back a little bit to Ashoka and Ashoka's father who was Bindusara. So Bindusara had uh, various children, Ashoka was one of them and uh, uh, Bindusara was reigning from the capital of Pataliputta which is where modern day Patna is in India. That's the capital now of Bihar state. Uh, so he was ruling from that capital and he had many children and you know, one of the things that they would do to prepare the children to be able to take over the reins of government when it came time would be to send them to various districts, send them to various areas and make them kind of uh, what is called uparaja really, like princes of those smaller areas within the empire and of course you know the uh, people who are ruling can be trusted to rule uh, you know in, in uh, line with their uh, father's wishes. So Ahsoka was actually sent to Awanti. Awanti is basically where 
uh, Madhya Pradesh is now, it's really in the very heart of India and as he was going he was sent to the capital which is Ujjain and on the way he stopped at a smaller town called Vidisa. So at Vidisa he's put up in a merchant's home and when he was staying in the merchant's home the merchant had a beautiful daughter. So Ahsoka saw the daughter and he uh, requested by giving like a dowry, giving presents to the merchant so that he could marry um, this daughter. And it's from this daughter of Vidisa that they had uh, two children. The children are two years apart. First born was Mahinda, who figures so largely later in our story. And the second one is uh, Sangamitta, a daughter. So there was these two children and they were brought up in Ujjain, which is the capital. Now later, um, the king Bindusara passed away as all kings and all people must do. And Ahsoka quickly returned to the capital of Pataliputta. Now, you know, in those days, the kings didn't have one wife because they were able to support, you know, basically as many as they could, then uh, they would have many wives and uh, Bindusara had had, according to the kind of legend, if you like, 99 other children besides Ahsoka and his brother Tissa. So Ahsoka and Tissa were by one wife and the other 99 children were by other wives. But of course all those children are rivals to the throne. So Ashoka, you know, his life falls into two parts. In his early life, he was quite uh, a violent person. Only in his later life did he come to conversion and become a Buddhist. So in his early life, he was known as Chanda Ashoka. It means violent Ashoka. And one of the reasons that he got that name is because he killed all 99 of his brothers uh, so that there would be no rivals. But he didn't kill his own uh, brother from his, you know, from his mother. Okay, but he killed the others. He, he ascended to the throne and he expanded the empire as well. That was also a very violent campaign that he waged in what is now Arissa. In those days it was known as Kalinga. During that campaign, about a hundred thousand people died in the war as he was um, attacking them. Some have died, of course, from the, you know, the real outcome of war. That means, you know, from, uh, you know, from fighting and so on and so forth. But a lot just died from the famine that was uh, brought on by the war and the chaos and the disruption of infrastructure and everything like this. It was only after that occasion, you see, that Ashoka uh, come to his conversion. And what happened was, there was one novice called Negroda, that means one Buddhist novice, called uh, Negroda. And Ahsoka saw uh, this novice walking in town and he was very impressed by his uh, demeanor. That means he was very self-controlled, uh, very, um, you know, in a very nice way, he's walking through town and he impressed Ahsoka. Now, his father, Bindusara, 
at actually been supporting all different types of ascetic groups and Brahmins and so on and so forth. But Ahsoka saw that the many of these ascetics actually were not very self-controlled and they were not uh, really um, in, you know, acting in a way that we expect ascetics to behave with you know, good sealer, self-restraint and so on and so forth like this. So he was already uh, disillusioned with a lot of the ascetics and then he saw Negroda who was a prime example of a good ascetic if you like. And that was um, also one of the reasons why he converted and converted to Buddhism. Now Ahsoka, as I've often mentioned, is the most important person after the Buddha himself because it's because of Ahsoka, King Ahsoka, that the uh, religion spread out throughout his empire and especially to the edges of his empire and then from there spread out to Southeast Asia, a later time of course, spread out to Southeast Asia and spread out to China. Yeah, That's where Buddhism has been preserved in the northern tradition and in the southern tradition and it died out as we all know eventually in its Indian heartland. Uh, so it's through Ashoka's efforts uh, that we really receive uh, Buddhism. Now during um, Ahsoka's time, first of all his brother and his nephew, that is Sangamitta's husband, okay, and his brother Tissa, they both went forth and ordained themselves, okay. And then, um, at the, around the same time, Ahsoka began his uh, good works on behalf of Buddhism. He built, traditionally it, sell, it said, 84,000 temples throughout India and the regions of the empire. India in those days, of course, run all the way up to Afghanistan. It run all the way up to Central Asia and, you know, uh, also into Bangladesh. What, that's the area, you know, it's much bigger than what India is today. Uh, so he built 84,000 temples and he also found the original relics from the Buddha uh, that had been preserved. They were originally divided up and placed in chaitiyas. So he opened those chaitiyas and then he re-divided them and sent the relics out to the various monasteries like this. Now the head or the chief monk of the Sangha at that time was a monk called Mogali Puttatissa. And Mogali Puttatissa is a very important monk who plays a big part a big role in this uh, story. And it was Mowgli Puttatissa who actually uh, eventually called the Third Council. What they did, they found that because Ahsoka was favoring Buddhists, that a lot of the ascetics from the other religions took on Buddhist robes and then they entered the sasana, but just for the gains of it, just for the material gains. But they were not actually really Buddhists, they're just dressing as Buddhists because then they can get the support and the outside groups were not getting the support. So with the help of Mogali Put Puttatissa, then Ahsoka managed to purify the Sangha and uh, many of the monks who held wrong views and so on and so forth, they were disrobed and sent back to kind of lay life, if you like. And um, he managed to, uh, first of all, purify the Sangha 
and then hold what is now known as the Third Council. So the Third Council is really the time that the tree Pitaka, as we receive it today, was properly established at uh, Mowgli Putatissa's council. There were 1,000 monks who had memorized the tree Pitaka, who were Arahats, so forth. And they confirmed uh, the teaching that was being brought down in the uh, orthodox tradition, what we now call the Theravada tradition. In those days it was called Vibhajavada, but it developed into what we now call uh, Theravada. So, following the council, Ashoka did this really marvelous thing, which is w with Mowgli Putatissa, he elected certain of the leading monks to take the teachings to the far corners of the empire. Right. In the middle of the empire, close to the heart, even for a long way of course, it was already mainly Buddhist. But on the border areas, on the edges, they had yet to receive Buddhism. So he sent the, uh, these leading monks out to the, uh, to the far uh, distant areas. And there's also a couple of interesting things about this. For instance, one of the monks that was sent was um, a monk called uh, Dhammarakita. And he was a Greek, not what we would say is an Indian. But the Greeks during Alexander's time had come up to around Pakistan. And when Alexander had uh, retreated, many of the Greeks just stayed in place where they had come to. And that was known as the I Ionian territory. So the Ionians were there. They, that's another word for Greek, okay. So some of the Greeks had converted to Buddhism and one of the leading members of the Sangha was actually uh, what we would now say a Westerner. He went to Aparantika which is around, uh, perhaps around Gujarat, that sort of area now. And another monk, Maharakita, he was sent to uh, to the Iona areas, so you know, it was quite a big area up toward, you know, in Pakistan and up towards Afghanistan. Another important mission was Sona and Uttara's mission. Now there's disputes about where they went. In the text it says uh, Suwanabumi, so the Thais think Suwanabumi is Thailand, the Burmese think Suwanabumi is uh, Burma. But anyway, it's into what we now call Southeast Asia. And then the other mission is the mission that we're concerned about tonight, where Mahinda was sent to Sri Lanka. And now it's interesting, when we read the reports about these missions, that there was two different ways that they were um, impressing themselves on people. Uh, on the one hand, they were showing that the, the powers that they had as Arahats were more powerful than the indigenous religions and the Nagas and, you know, the Yakas and so on had. So the Arahats had more powers and they could uh, subdue the spirits in these border areas. Yeah? So one of the things that they were doing was showing that Buddhism was more powerful than the nature religions that were uh, prevalent in these border areas. And the second thing that they did was actually preach the 
suttas and uh, we're even told what suttas were preached by which missionaries in which areas and those suttas can uh, also be found in the tree pitika uh, today and um, you know we can actually go back and read the uh, the discourses that they taught when they first arrived in these countries and what the you know what the message was that they were giving to them now before mahinda went he could see that uh, in sri lanka the king was very old the king's name is mutasiva and mutasiva was very old and would not be able to properly establish the sasana so mahinda rather than going uh, straight away he returned to his hometown vidissa and to vidissagiri where his mother had built a monastery and he waited there for about six months until mutasiva had passed away and devanan pietissa had ascended to the throne and devanan pietissa was a, obviously a younger king he was uh, you know more able uh, to take on new ideas and more able to establish them in the country as well and devanan pietissa uh, was already uh, kind of related by uh, suzerainty to asoka yeah he, they, it was a border area but he owed allegiance to ashoka um and had to pay you know um had to pay allegiance and had to pay uh you know give gifts and so on and so forth like this so now when devanan pietissa ascended the throne then mahinda together with um the other people who went itia notia sambala and bandasala and also the novice sumana sumana is sangamitta's son okay who would become a novice and also um uh, banduka who was also some sort of relative in that family but i can't quite work out it might be tissa's tissa's uh, son or nephew or something like that so they were left from uh, vidisagiri which is in the center of india and they came to sri lanka um and they arrived at what is called misikapabata which is the mountain that we now call mahintali so mahintali is this place where everybody goes on this day to commemorate uh, the arrival of mahinda and the arrival basically of the religion in the country at that time it was the possan full moon day now the full moon days always in uh, ancient society as in modern society they were festival days so devanan pietissa had held a fest- festival in anuradhapura a water festival and afterwards he went out deer hunting into the countryside around and as he was uh, engaged in this deer hunting then he came upon mahinda who had just arrived in the country with these other uh, arahats and um these other monks and so on like this and he was very surprised when he saw mahinda because for one thing mahinda was wearing robes like these and he had shaved head and everything like that and mahinda called him by name but there's you know he had never met him before 
So there was kind of a surprise element or something like that, that somehow Mahinder already knew the king's name like this. It might also be that, you know, what can we say, uh, common people would not normally be allowed to take the king's name. But Mahinda, uh, with his full confidence, being an Arahat, you see, he called the king by name and was not afraid to do so. Yeah. So the king was very surprised. And then he taught one very famous sutta. It's called Chulahati Padopama Sutta. It means the simile of the elephant's foot. And this is an important sutta which we can now find in uh, the Majjhima Nikayas, Majjhima Nikaya 27. And it's about people who came to refute the Buddha's teaching. And then, of course, the Buddha, you know, is not refuted at all, but establishes his teaching. And uh, they land up as disciples of the Buddha. And then the Buddha teaches the gradual path to awakening in that uh, sutta. So it's an outline. First of all, the conversion of the heretics, if you like, and then the teaching, the basic teaching of the uh, Buddhist path to liberation. And so the king was converted on that teaching. And as you might know, in the olden days, even in modern days, it can happen as well. But in the olden days, when the king converted, then the ministers would start converting, the nobles would convert, and then, you know, the merchants would convert, and the common people would all convert as well. In fact, if you think about it, a similar thing happened in the 15th century in Malaysia, where the Sultan of Johor converted to Islam, yeah, and it's from that that the ministers and so on and everybody converted in Johor and Islam got a, a hold in uh, Malaysia, whereas it hadn't had a hold before. It was um, basically a Hindu and Buddhist kingdom before that time. So that's that's basically, you know, the kings way the kings uh, wield so much authority. You know, if the king converts, then the people convert. So, Devanand Pietisa converted, and then he wanted the people to be able to hear the teaching. So, they set up an area where Mahinda could give the teaching, and then Mahinda. Um, went into the city and Sumana, who was this novice, but this very, he, he was an Arahat, but he was a very pow powerful novice. And there's a nice story. He, he asked Sumana to call uh, for the teaching, to give the announcement for the teaching. A bit like when we give the, you know, we call the Devas to. Uh, come and listen to the teaching uh, before the pirit chanting and things like that. But when Sumana did it, he did it so loudly, it resounded over the whole of uh, Sri Lanka. And everybody in the country could hear this call to come and listen to the Dhamma teaching. And the Devas also heard it. And just like after the first discourse where the, you know, the Maharaja... Uh, hear, the, hear it and then they pass it up to the next gods and the next gods and it resounds throughout the uh, Deva Loka and then through the Brahma Loka so that the whole universe heard that this teaching was going to take place. Right. So Sumana started that by doing this uh, very uh, strong call for people to come and listen to the Dhamma. And then, uh, so the people came, and then they taught, uh, I suppose Mahinda, uh, taught the Sama Chitta Sutta, which is a sutta 
on gratitude. That's a, a ver, another very important sutta. Gratitude, as you know, is a very important uh, virtue in Buddhism. It's also, if you like, a very attractive teaching as well. If we if we talk about gratitude, talk about things uh, like loving kindness, it's also very positive. You know, we all realize that we should be grateful uh, for you know our own uh, situation and for what we've received and for uh, you know for our parents and so on and so forth like this. So. Um, then they gave this teaching, more people heard it, more people converted. Yeah. And then they set up like a decorated mandapa, you know, a bit like when we put up outside here during Vesak and we put up these temporary structures, you know, cloth structures over the top here, yeah. That's called a mandapa in Pali. So they erected a temporary mandapa like that and then more people could come. And one of the very important people who came at that time is Queen Anula. And Queen Anula uh, was Devanampiatissa's brother's queen. Yeah. And she heard the teaching at that time, they taught the Peta Watu and the Vimana Watu and Sacha Samyutta. Uh, these are d discourses about um, Kama and Vipaka and the rewards that are got for right, right deeds and for wrong deeds. So also, you see, a very important teaching, uh, a very central and important teaching. And Queen Anala and her uh, attendants, 500 attendants, they all attained to Sotapanna at that time. So that also is a very important step when the first people attain to the first stage of the path. It was Queen Anula and the 500 women who listen to these discourses. And then, you know, the next day, there's more and more people want to come and listen. And then they cleaned out a bigger area and prepared it so that more people could attend. And then they taught the Devaduta Sutta. That's in Majjhima Nikaya also. And a thousand people attained. And then two and a half thousand attained and 1,000 others attained as it's going on as they're giving more teachings like this. And one important thing I think is this, that Mahinda was teaching in, of course he would have to you see, he was teaching in singular. He's not teaching in you know the uh, Magadha because people would not be able, which is, would be his home language, you see. He, they would not be able to understand Magadha. So he was teaching in the language of the country, making the teachings known. The teachings are established in Magadha or Pali. But this is the origin, of course, of the commentaries, because he would give the teaching first in Pali and then he would explain the teaching in singular. So the original commentaries that came down up until the 5th century, 7 centuries later, were uh, recorded in singular. Yeah. So the uh, teachings and the explanations behind the teachings, direct translations and the explanations which became the commentaries uh, started at that time. In fact, the commentaries would have started earlier, but the commentaries that we receive started at that time with the explanations of the suttas and what they, you know, what they could um, understand from it. So, 
In fact, even today, you know, recently I was in Sri Lanka and at one monastery and the head monk there did exactly the same. He actually, he, he gets the sutta and he reads the sutta first in Pali out loud and then he gives an oral translation into singular. Yeah? And then he gives an explanation. So it was very interesting to see this still happening in exactly the same way that Mahinda must have been doing it, you see. He reads the scripture in Pali and then he gives a translation of the sutta and then he explains all the ins and outs and it like that. So it, it rung a bell when I uh, saw those teachings. He's giving teachings every day and about an hour and a half every day he's giving these teachings like this. People ask questions and he refers to the suttas to be able to answer it like that. A re really wonderful thing to see. It was really a good experience to attend those um, teachings every day. Now then, at the end of that day, then the monks left because they're not going to stay in the city overnight. They want to go to a more secluded area. So they left and the, they told the king that the monks were leaving. The king followed them out. And first of all, he offered them uh, Nandana Uyana, which is just south of Anuradhapura. It means the joy garden, I suppose. Uh, he offered them Nandana. But they said it's too close to the city. And uh, then they went a bit further south to Mahamega Uyana. And Mahamega Uyana um, is the place where the king gave one of his royal parks to be the first monastery in Sri Lanka. So it's a very, uh, again you see, it's a very important landmark in Anuradhapura or just outside of Anuradhapura. The Mahamega, it means the Great Cloud Monastery. That was the first monastery that was established in uh, Sri Lanka. But for the rains retreat, Mahinda and his companions retreated back to uh, Misika Pabata, uh, which is the mountain where they had um, first arrived in Sri Lanka. And Devanan Piyatissa prepared 68 rock cut cells in that mountain. You can go and see those cells uh, still to this day. They show the cell where Mahinda spent the first range retreat. And Mahinda also pointed out various places around Anuradhapura that would become of great importance later in the Sasana where, you know, very large stupas were going to be built and where monasteries were going to be established. He showed the king where these areas were and um, he also showed the place where the four previous Buddhas in this aeon had uh, been in Sri Lanka. So that's at the spot where the Bodhi tree was eventually planted. Uh, at some point, uh, Mahinda was still giving uh, teachings and then Queen Anala and the, uh, the other ladies of the court, they attained to Sakadagami. And at that point, they requested ordination. But the monks by themselves were not able to give ordination. So Mahinda explained that his sister Sangamitta was a nun, uh, an experienced nun, an arahat herself, and she was back in Magadha, and that he should send for Sangamitta 
to come to Sri Lanka and also to bring the Bodhi tree, a branch of the Bodhi tree, to Sri Lanka so that it could be uh, established there. So the king sent one of his ministers, a Ritta, and a Ritta sailing up the Bay of what is now the Bay of Bengal um, came to within uh, probably actually went to Pataliputta. It probably went all the way to Pataliputta because it's on the Ganges, so they would have been able to sail right in. And then made the request for Sangamitta to come and for her to bring the other nuns that are necessary, another 12 nuns besides herself, and also the Bodhi tree. Uh, the Bodhi tree, it's hard to explain how important the Bodhi tree is to Sri Lankans and to the Sri Lankan tradition. When the Bodhi tree was eventually planted, it's like, you know, a visible symbol of the presence of the Buddha in Sri Lanka. That tree is still there today. It's a historical tree. That tree, 2,200 years later, you can visit that tree and that's the tree that was planted at that time. There's a very moving scene, in fact, where Ahsoka uh, gives permission for his daughter to go. But there was, he was not happy originally because he's already lost Mahinda and he's lost Sumana, that's his son and his grandson. And he says to Sangamitta, if you go, you also will never return to, uh, you know, to India. You also will just go and I'll never see you again. But anyway, eventually he gives her permission to go. They sail down through the Bay of Bengal. On the way there's a nice kind of, um, a nice little scene where the Nagas make, you know, the Nagas live in the water. So the Nagas stilled the waters so they couldn't make any progress. And then uh, uh, Sangamitta, who is more powerful, you know, as, one, as we were saying earlier, she's more powerful being an Arahat than the Nagas and the Yakas and any of these kind of creatures. So she can, uh, kind of... Uh, converted herself into a supana. A uh, supana is a traditional enemy of a naga and then kind of overwhelmed the nagas. But the nagas said that they wanted to worship the Bodhi tree for seven days. So uh, Sangamitta gave them permission to take the Bodhi tree to Nagaland under the ocean and worship the tree for seven days on the promise that she would return it that they would return it to, to her. So they returned it after seven days and then eventually she made it all the way to Sri Lanka. Also, you can see the spot in Sri Lanka it's called Jambukola. So you can go to Jambukola and see the place where Sangamitta disembarked. The king came up from Anuradhapura to meet the ship that was coming down from India. And then the king, you'll sometimes see representations of this, the king went into the ocean up to his neck as the boat came in and then they placed the Bodhi tree on his head and then he brought it onto land, you see. Before uh, Ahsoka had sent that sapling, it's only a sapling, yeah. So before he had sent that sapling, he had given it sovereignty over his empire for seven days. And when King Devanan Piyatissa received that Bodhi tree, he did the same thing. He made the Bodhi tree the king of Sri Lanka for seven days. And then they returned down to Anuradhapura with it and they planted it 
in the place where you can now see it. And it's actually what we say a palladium of the country, you know. It's a symbol of their heritage, a symbol of the religion, a symbol of their great civilization that was established so early like this. So the Bodhi tree is a very important thing. Uh, that's why we still, in the Sri Lankan tradition, we do Bodhi Puja, whereas the Thais have no idea about Bodhi Puja because they don't have the, the Bodhi tree like the Sri Lankans had the Bodhi tree. It didn't play such an important part uh, as it plays in the uh, Sri Lankan uh, tradition. Now, uh, after that, a thousand uh, nuns ordained, or a thousand you know, ladies ordained as nuns, and uh, that was also a very important part of the establishment of the tradition in Sri Lanka and you can say that really both Mahinda and Sangamitta, the brother and the sister, are really equally uh, held in esteem in Sri Lanka because of their role in bringing the religion uh, to the country. And everywhere you go in Sri Lanka, you'll find buildings named after them and streets are named after them and schools are named after them. And, you know, ev everywhere you go, you find reminders of them because they're held in such high esteem like this. Now then, uh, 12 years later, after the bringing of the... Um, Bodhi tree to Sri Lanka. Back in India, Ashoka's queen passed away. That's the Sandimitta. She passed away. And then he married another queen. She's called Tissadevi. So Tissadevi was very jealous by nature. And seeing the devotion that Ashoka had to the Bodhi tree, yeah. she determined to destroy the Bodhi tree. So only a few years later, uh, with what is said to be a poisoned thorn, then Tissadevi managed to poison that tree and destroy it. And only four days later, in grief, Asoka himself passed away, yeah. dying of grief over the death of the Bodhi tree. So the direct descendant, you see, of the Bodhi tree is the tree that is at Anuradhapura. And when they needed to re-establish a tree in uh, Bodhgaya in the 19th century, they went to Anuradhapura and took a sapling from Anuradhapura and then planted it. That's the tree you see now in Bodhgaya. It's not the original tree, of course. It's a long time dead. Okay, now Devanand Piyatissa, a bit like Ashoka in India, who had established all these monasteries, then uh, Devanand Piyatissa himself established many monasteries in Anuradhapura and throughout the country. And he also established nunneries because there were many nuns in the country as well. And he built many chaitiyas. Many of those chaitiyas you can actually still see till today. And he also brought relics from the, uh, from the heartland in India and he established the relics in those chaitiyas. And uh, he also brought the Bodhi tree. He also established this, what, it, what is basically like a hydraulic civilization, if you can understand. Sri Lanka itself doesn't have uh, many natural lakes. In fact, it basically, of any size, it has no natural lakes. But it, the whole country is covered in artificial lakes, 
man-made lakes that were used, even some that are very, very big, huge uh, lakes, you know, you can hardly see the end of them. Uh, if you're stood on one shore, you can hardly see the other shore. So they established this hydraulic civilization and, you know, water is very important because once you can, uh, once you can collect the water, then you can also um, irrigate the land. Once you can irrigate the land, you can grow rice and other crops and you can establish a large city population. Yeah. Until you've got that sort of situation, you cannot do it. So, in fact, the establishment of the tanks and this, what we can say, hydraulic civilization is also a very important thing. They were technologically very, very advanced. Even you see the stupas, they're huge. Some of them are as big as the pyramids in Egypt. They are very, you know, very big structures. That means that they had a very uh, powerful technological civilization established at a very early time in Sri Lanka. And it developed, of course, throughout the Middle Ages as well. So, Devanand Piyatissa, just like Ashoka in India, established this civilization and uh, he lived on for about 40 years after the bringing of the uh, religion to the country. And eventually, uh, Devanand Piyatissa, like all kings, passed away. Mahinda uh, survived him by eight years. His brother, um, that means Devanand Piyatissa's brother, Uttir, became king. And Mahinda, uh, 60 years of ordination, uh, he passed away as well. And just as Ashoka had predicted, he never did return to India. In fact, none of the missionaries did return. They went and they stayed and they established the religion and they didn't go back. So there was a big festival when Mahinda passed away, of course, you know, like a seven-day um, festival. And the king himself placed Mahinda's body on the pyre. And then one year later, Sangamitta passed away. Arahat Sangamitta passed away. And then the other elders, the missionaries who had come at that time, they also passed away. So that first generation of missionaries, eventually, of course, they all passed away. But by that time, the religion was really well established in Sri Lanka. Monasteries in all over the country and the lineage well established, able to pass it on to the coming generations. And from that time to this time, in direct lineage, the religion has been passed down. And that's how we get the Sri Lankan Sangha of today. Okay? So everybody say Sadhu.